that that song has a really special place in my heart. There's a t- there's a portion of scripture in John 21 where Jesus goes for a walk with Peter after he's risen from the dead, and he goes for this walk. And after Peter has denied him three times, after that whole process takes place, Jesus is crucified. Now he's back from the dead. He just finished breakfast with his disciples after rising from the dead. Pretty crazy story. But he goes for a walk with Peter, and three times, almost in a redemptive sort of way, after Peter's denied him three times, he goes for a walk and says, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes, I love you. Jesus says, feed my sheep. And he asks him again, Peter, do you love me? He says, yes, I love you. And asks him a third time, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. I think so much of what Jesus wants from us, I think really everything, if you wanted to sum Christianity up, what he really wants, what Jesus really wants is for you to fall in love with him. Because I'm in love with my beautiful wife. And if I get started bragging about her, Right? Yeah. If I get started bragging about her, I'll, I'll make the sermon go long. This whole message will be caught up in it and it'll go on for two or three hours because I'm obsessed with I can tell you all the different ways and all the different things I love about her. Right? I'm in love with her. You're going to hear about it. The guys who hang out with me throughout the week know that, yeah, we know you love your wife. We know. We know. Yeah. You don't have to tell us again because I love her. You, you can't help but hear about it from me, how much I'm devoted to, I'm so in love with, I want to spend time with, all the different details that I've fallen for in her. The same way when I'm devoted to, when I've fallen in love with Jesus, the more you get to know me, the more you're going to hear about him. Right? He just wants you to fall in love with him. He doesn't want you to follow a certain set rule book that he's created. That's not what this is. It's all about the relationship. And I can't say that I'm in love with my wife and, not, and go then weeks or days without talking to her. Without spending one-on-one time with her. Without showing it to her. Without serving her in some way. Without figuring out which ways does she feel most loved. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go after her and serve her and love her in those ways. To show her I'm going to go above and beyond. I know you well. And I want to show you that. You matter. In the same way, when you're in love with Jesus, like he was checking with Peter, if you love me, he said, go feed my sheep. But you know if you love God because it comes out of you. You can't resist talking about it. You can't resist the feeling inside you, how you get a little bit overwhelmed. You get butterflies in your stomach almost. And I love Jesus and that song so much. What it, the purpose of it is is just say, Jesus, we love you. 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 We'll say it over and over and over and over again. Because we are so obsessed. We love you so much. Nate preached a message a a couple weeks ago now, and he said something in there that convicted me personally. And if you listen closely to his messages, you'll get that pretty often. You'll you'll get a little bit of conviction from what he says. But what he said is within salvation, within who we become when we are saved, we don't have any power or any ability to do that ourselves. That is all the work of God. Ephesians 2. Two tells us that it's by grace you have been saved through your faith, but it's not anything that you've done. There's nothing that you have done that has caused this salvation to occur. It's all because of his free gift of grace, because he loved you so much, because he came and found you, because you were dead in your transgressions, the Bible tells us. I joke with this with a couple of my friends quite a bit and say, what, what can you do if you're dead? What abilities do you have if you're dead? Nothing. You can do nothing. There's literally no, no strategy or thought or anything you can do. You were dead, and Jesus made you alive. Amen. Right? And he said, there's nothing you can do. It's not in your ability. It's not within your power. All we can do is now when we are saved to turn our affections towards, to tap into what he's made available to us, to turn ourselves towards him, submit ourselves to him. In Galatians, there's a really cool portion of Scripture And this is kind of coming around to, like I said, I I was convicted this last week. My tendency, maybe not my tendency, but I think the Holy Spirit just wanted to check me a little bit to make sure I wasn't being drawn into something that I hate. So there's a thing that is called works-based righteousness. That we were saved by grace, right? By nothing we have done. We were given this gift, and now we are risen to new life with a brand new identity. Right? Now in salvation... What I had been even tending towards a little bit, and a lot of it's because I've, I've had the opportunity for some really intentional discipleship. But in that intentional discipleship, I've had a tendency to say, okay, what are your goals? How do you want to improve? What are you going to be doing to get yourself closer to God is a lot of what my language almost sounded like. And I could feel myself 
within the conviction that Nate delivered, it was, it was like, wow, 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 I might be drifting over towards a religious type of mindset saying, now I was saved by grace, but now in salvation I need to earn some things. And there are certain things that I have power over. In Galatians 3 it says this, O foolish Galatians, this is Paul writing to the church at Galatia, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you this. Did you receive the Holy Spirit? Did you receive salvation by works of the law or by hearing with faith? The correct answer is hearing with faith. It was by grace, through faith, that we were saved, not by the works of the law. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and after your salvation works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith. And it's this idea that in the same way, we don't have the power to save ourselves, that we can't behave our way into salvation, we can't behave our way into heaven. If that was a possibility, if we could be good enough to get to heaven, we didn't need Jesus to come and die. Because that means there was an alternative option, that we could be good enough to get there. We couldn't, we can't, it's impossible. So Jesus had to come. And we had to receive a gift of grace. It's the only way we could get there. Now, in the same way, when we said we want to live in Christ, we want to walk in Christ, we want to continuously be renewed into the image of Jesus. And all of those language pieces you'll hear from us consistently up here, in the same way, it comes through the Spirit. It comes to that submission of grace, that submission of the gift of God that he's given us. And this is what Jesus provided for us when he died for us on the cross. He says, I'm going to put myself, I'm going to die so that all your sins can die with me. They will be buried into the ground. They will be gone forever. And when I rise to new life, three days later, Jesus rose from the dead. He was dead, then now he's alive. Came back from the dead, rising victoriously, saying, we are now victorious. I am now victorious over sin, over the devil, over hell, over death. Those things have no hold on me because we've risen victoriously with Christ. All of it, guys, has been a gift from him because he loves you. Because he says, you're worth me dying for. You're worth my time. You're worth my affection. I want to have a relationship with you. I want you to love me the way that I love you. I really just want you to respond. I'll do all the pursuing. I'll pursue you. I'll save you. I'll not only give you this gift of grace and salvation, I'll bring you into my family. Say you are a son and daughter of mine. All of that, none of that is by your works. None of that is by anything that you have done. You get into this family, this royal family, a son or daughter of God just by all his goodness. And what he asks for in return is for us to say thank you. Just to recognize all the love which he has lavished upon us and to respond. How can you not respond? Man, I like him. Man, I love him. God, thank you. You are so worth my time to praise you to worship you for all the good things you've done. You're so worth my time to say, I'm going to press pause on my day to just spend time and talk with you about anything because you're a good father like we sang about there. You're a good father who wants to hear from his children. You just want to spend time with them. You just want to be with them. I heard a thing a couple weeks ago that, well, every time I pray, I just fall asleep. And the pastor that said this said, "I've, I've never been upset where my children have fallen asleep in my arms. Right? That's the idea that, man, if you talk to God and you're like, that's so boring, I just fall asleep, or it's so boring, it's, I, don't, I can't do it for very long, or whatever, it's okay. He loves you. He just wants to be with you. He's provided so much for you. Like I said, my tendency was to go the opposite way, not to acknowledge him for all he is. Not to just continuously say, hey, I can have a lot of good ideas. I can have a lot of clever strategies. I can be cool enough and I can be fun enough and I can be engaging enough to build relationships and to advance this kingdom through my plowing. Now there's a response that I say, yes, I live from victory and I will do those things because because I'm empowered by his Holy Spirit that he's given me. It's a constant gratitude lifestyle. Today what we're going to do, we're going to take communion. And what we do when we take communion is we remember what Jesus has done for us. 
that in his perfect life, sinless life, he was able to be the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. The whole Old Testament is built on a sacrificial system where animals had to be put to death for the sins of the people. Jesus, God said, I'm going to put to death that old covenant and create a new one. He died for you and for your sins so that we can now live in freedom and there is no more sacrificial system needed because he satisfied every penalty, every weight, every debt upon your life and everyone's life who will put their faith in him. And he said, when you gather together, <clears throat> I'll read it from, from 1 Corinthians 11 where Paul says this to uh, the church at Corinth. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, and drink the cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We do this in remembrance. It's a, it's a physical example of what Jesus has done for us, saying, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for you. Do this in remembrance. Eat my flesh, drink my blood so that you have me inside of you, so that you have me with you, so that you remember everything that you have been given. So what we're going to do is I'm going to come over and take the lids off the bread and the cup. We'll form a line, grab one of each, take it back to your seat, and in your seat, sit there and just, just remember this is for those of you that are saved. Sit there and remember where you were and who you were. The old you. The one who was dead in their transgressions. The one who was an enemy of God, an orphan, blind. Remember that person who lived in the sinful lifestyle, the way of the world. And then realize that when salvation came and when Jesus entered into your life, look at what's new now. Look at the transformation and remember what Jesus has done for you. Not for just the whole general populace of the world, but he did it for you. With you in mind, he died, rose to new life so that you could rise victorious in him and live out of this new identity. To say that you are a new creation. The old is gone. It's passed away. The new you has now come and we can live from victory. Amen. Because he beat all the greatest enemies we could possibly have. Let me pray for us and then I'll send you guys up here, okay? Jesus, thank you so much. We adore you. We submit our time. We submit ourselves to you because you have renewed us. You have redeemed us. You've given us a brand new identity that we are victorious in you. That we get to be a part of your family. That we get to be a part of your mission. Where we can be ambassadors of yours, spreading your kingdom here on earth, bringing your will to earth as it is in heaven. God, you want to build a friendship with us. Father, renew people's minds here right now. The way that they see you, let them know you're in a good mood. You are a God of joy. You are good. You're not angry. You're not spiteful. You're not feeling making people feel guilty. What you want for them is to know how much they're cherished, how much they're loved, that you would literally send your only son so that you could have a relationship with every single individual in this room. That's how valuable you think each person is here. God, let people see you in such a way that you smile over them. You are rejoicing over them. You're singing over them. You're dancing over them. You have nothing but joy and pleasure in who they are. God, there's not some future version of themselves when they get it all together, when they figure everything out. That's the person you love. No, you love them as much as you could right now, right here in this moment. 100% God, you love them. It is not based on what you might do or might not do. It is based that you are his. Jesus, thank you. We love you. We continue to worship you with this time. And we remember everything that you have done for us. Thank you for adoption. Thank you for salvation. Thank you that we now get to live a life in freedom, walking every single day with the creator of the universe, talking with us and listening to us. 
It is an honor to do this life with you, God. We remember everything you've done right here, right now. We bless your name. Amen. Be a leader. Come on up and grab some. for the last seven or eight weeks that we've been going through a sermon series on our core values or the core values of the culture that we want to create here at Kingdom Life. Um, And I wrote them down, what we've been going through so far, just so you guys can kind of bring it back to remembrance. There might be specific messages that we've spoken. You're like, oh yeah, that, I wanted to study a little deeper into that and I forgot to. Um, But one that we gave the first week was that God is good. We talked about that a little bit at communion, but God is good. He's in a good mood. And that's kind of a cornerstone of theology. There's a lot of people who picture and see God as a judgmental or evil or Zeus up in the sky with a lightning bolt ready to strike you. Uh, But God is good, and he's in a good mood, and he he sees you and loves you and cherishes you, and that's who he really is. He is good. It's one of the best descriptive words you can find for him. And Knowing the character of God is so important for your walk. Nate preached a message called His Kingdom is Advancing. Remember that one? I was powerful. It was a good one that Jesus' kingdom, the kingdom of God, is continuing to advance and advances through us as ambassadors in his kingdom. It is now our responsibility and our opportunity to partner with God, the creator of everything, to advance his kingdom. I I got to speak on creating healthy families. That's one of our core values. One of the primary reasons we do husbands and wives in children's ministry serving together with helpers. We want to create healthy families. We want to empower you in your marriage. We want to empower you in your parenting skills. If you need any help in any of those areas, we want people to come alongside you and walk with you on those journeys because we believe out of healthy families and creating healthy families as families like the wagon maker family but also church family, right? That's, that's one of the more unhealthy families consistently that we see, I think. Uh, salvation creates a joyful identity. Nate preached on that one for us. When we get saved, we get this joyful identity that we get to live from victory, Right? We get to live from this new identity and identify how God sees us and live out of that. Beautiful core value. And then Bill spoke on how God's word transforms. That's the Holy Scriptures. It's what we always come back to. All Scriptures, God breathed, right? Useful for teaching, preaching, rebuking, training in righteousness. It's a sword. It's a hammer. It's all the best things that you want in your spiritual life. This is the foundation where we learn what God's voice sounds like so that when he speaks to us, we can hear him and know it's him. All right? This is very, very, very important. Today I'll be speaking on the core value that we have and that we want to live into here at Kingdom Life. Um, We say Jesus empowers supernatural ministry. Yeah, right? Ooh, good response. I wish I got that every time. Jesus empowers supernatural ministry. That's one of those concepts that can kind of get lost I think, that people kind of shy away from because when you preach on, hey, supernatural ministry is real, it's still happening, God still wants to be moving in supernatural ways, people can get uncomfortable, right? And a tendency is to ignore the supernatural side of God, and when you do that, a lot of times the reason you do is to gain favor with men. I fear what I'm going to preach, that I think God still heals people miraculously. I still think that God speaks prophetically, I believe the gift of tongues is alive and tangible and a gift that I've received and all these different ideas that I start bringing up, people start going like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, what are we doing here? What are we doing here? But I don't know about you, but I believe in a God who created the universe, like out of thin air, nothing, right? We see miraculous signs all throughout the Bible, Old or New Testament, of what God can do. He can do anything. And to say that I still believe God can do anything, I don't think is that far outside the box. I don't think it's that crazy especially when we have as much scriptural evidence as we do. And people's tendency, and something that we've preached about here consistently, and language we've used here consistently, is that a lot of times we want to put our theology in a place that matches our experience. I've never been healed. I've never had a prophetic word. I've never spoken in tongues. So I think what the Bible says, there's got to be a little bit more of a watered-down version. There's got to be something that's just a, there must be some misunderstanding And I'm going to bring the theology of the Bible down to my personal experience, the experience of the people that I respect, rather than take my experience and say, no, I'm going to raise up to the level of theology that the Bible communicates. I'm going to stay up here, whether or not I see the evidence of it. 
Because one day I don't want to get to heaven and say, Jesus, you said those who come after me will do the things that I have done. The same works that I've done, other people will do. Anything you ask in my name, you will do. In fact, even greater things will people do than what I have done. Like, you said that. I don't want to get to heaven someday and say, oh, you meant you wanted me to actually go for it. Right? You actually wanted me to step out in boldness and try things and to go places and to see what you did and try to do it as well. I want it. And so we, we don't want to be a, a church that brings our theology down to the experiences that we've seen day in or day out. We have people here in this room that have been miraculously healed, right? We have received prophetic words that have dictated where we're going, right? The way we spend our time has been dictated by a prophetic word. We want to be a church that is as biblical as possible. We get a lot of visitors here and a lot of visitors, it's almost like you can see it on them. And those of you that are visiting today, I know I just talked to you, Dan, and like I'm not meaning to project this on new visitors, but like people will come in here and try to categorize us a little bit. Okay, is this a charismatic church then? They're talking about gifts of the Spirit. They're, they're, they act this way. They pray for people. Or is this more of a traditional, fundamental, biblical community? They, I mean, they obviously preach verse by verse. They, they really go after the Bible. I'm going to use a lot of scripture today. What, what box do they fit in? And really, what, all we want to be is a biblical church. We want to be as biblical as possible. If we see it in the Bible, we're going to explore it. We're going to go after it. And if we're off, this is the safe place to fail. This is a good place to fail. Really, there is no failure. That's the language we want to use. There is only winning and learning. No losing and no failure. Amen. Right? We want, it, we want this to be a safe place. That like when Jesus says, hey, the sheep know and hear my voice. And it's, it's good to be able to learn and hear his voice while you're in the penned-in area, right? While you're in the gated spot, the fenced-in area. You want to know his voice here in church so that when we go outside the gate, the gated area outside our fencing to go and feed, to go live our day-to-day -day lives, we want to be able to hear the voice of Jesus and know it's him. Because it's out there where the wolves are. It's out there where the opportunities lie for supernatural ministry. So we want to learn together here in a safe environment, in the fenced-in area, to hear Jesus' voice and to follow his leading. To do what he did. Like he said, I do nothing that my father doesn't tell me to do, and I don't say anything that I don't hear my father say. We want to learn that sort of obedience. We want to learn that sort of in touch, that sort of deep, intimate involvement in my life by God. That's what I want to have. That's what I'm so hungry for. So we believe that Jesus empowers supernatural ministry. Leading into one of my favorite texts is uh, the Sermon on the Mount is Matthew 5 through 7, one of my favorite texts. Now, in Matthew, at the end of Matthew 4, it kind of gives a little taste of, hey, this is what Jesus was doing. Jesus went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, and those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. It says that great crowds followed him, and he continued to preach the message or the gospel of the kingdom. And we see Jesus miraculously over and over and over and over again healing people. Casting out demons. We see him also reading people's minds. <laughs> like, and the Pharisees were thinking to themselves, <laughs> it will open up, and then Jesus says, why are you saying that to yourself? <laughs> right? Like he gets a word of knowledge on people saying, why, why are you over here? That, that's not true. That's not good. Why are you so concerned about me eating and drinking with sinners? Why are you so concerned with this woman and what she's doing? Why are you so concerned? And he leads them into, hey, this is what truth is. This is what really matters. It's a matter of the heart. But we see Jesus doing supernatural things. And like I quoted earlier over in John 14, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. And whatever you ask in my name, this will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Here, at Kingdom Life, we're going to take that at face value. We want to live into the theology that we see in Scripture. We want to ask Jesus, we want to ask Jesus things in his name. Not his name being like a password. Like if I say Jesus, then I get an automatic when I get an automatic healing, I get an automatic prophetic word. If I say, in Jesus' name, you might, you might, yes. But we're going to continue to go after it faithfully until we see the fruit of it. 
okay? Because that's the biggest contention, right? I prayed for people and they didn't get healed. Okay, yeah. I've prayed for people and they've gotten healed. But I asked, I've also prayed for many people and they haven't been healed. What are you going to do? How are you going to choose to live your life? What's more worth your time? Is it going after what Jesus says, hey, this is what I have for you? Or is it going to be, oh, I don't want to be embarrassed. I'm a little bit nervous about what people are going to think of me. I'm nervous that I might do more damage than good, right? Because that's, a, that's almost a legitimate concern, I feel like. I'm, I'm nervous that if I pray for somebody and they don't get healed, they're going to be even more angry at God. Let God handle it. You do what you were called to do. You were called to pray for the sick. Yeah. Okay, and let Jesus do what Jesus is built to do. God can handle those tough questions, and God can redeem anything. And you going after his kingdom, you trying to bring his kingdom to earth, isn't going to destroy someone's faith. It's giving the opportunity. If you look in the book of Acts, which we're going to go there in a little bit, just to see the different giftings of the Holy Spirit at work, and to see that full cities came to Jesus. We see it with Jesus and the woman at the well, when he gives her a word of knowledge, saying, you've had five husbands, the man you're living with now is not your husband, we see that that prophetic word, that that word of knowledge leads to that whole city being saved and putting their faith in God. Amen. That's the opportunity of supernatural giftings empowered by Jesus. Let's skip over to, I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians 12. I'm going to bounce around a lot. There's a lot I want to say, but I'm trying to be efficient with it. So I'm sorry if I bounce around a little too much. I'm, God, please give me clarity in my words. 1 Corinthians 12, this is Paul writing to the church at Corinth. He says this to them. He says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. It's very, that's very convenient that we get that, this copy of this letter. Because <laughs> he's saying, I'm, about spiritual gifts, let me give you more information about them. Let me give you some insight about it because it's real. They exist and they're happening. We just want to give you a little more clarity. Now there are a variety of gifts, this is verse 4, now, there are a variety of gifts, and those are free gifts, similar to salvation. There are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are a variety of service or ministries, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all in everyone. Remember what I said earlier, that, hey, salvation was not by anything I've done? And my maturing in Christ and my growth in Christ is not necessarily by me. It's the continued empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And it's me submitting to him in order for him to do the work. Right? Because Jesus said, remember, you've heard it said, don't sleep with your neighbor's wife. That's what the law said. I'm telling you, don't even look upon a woman lustfully. Doesn't that seem just like a harder law? Like I had the law, I had the law not to sleep with my, mother, with, or with my brother's wife or with my neighbor's wife. But now Jesus is saying, don't even look upon a woman lustfully. That's even harder to do. Right? It's even more challenge. It's even more of a law, even more rules to follow is what it seems like. But really what he's saying is that I'm going to give you the grace to live above the law. Amen. That grace empowers us to live above what the law expects of us. Right? It's a better way. God empowers all these gifts in everyone. Verse 7, to each is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So you're not given a gift to be like, look how special I am, or I'm going to be a prophet, so I'm going to come up and share a word, and I'm going to get elevated into leadership. That's not the way we measure anyways. But the gift that you are given is not for your own good or for your own benefit. It's for the common good or the benefit of your community, the benefit of the body of Christ. For to one is given through the Spirit the, a word of wisdom. To another, the utterance or a word of knowledge according to that same Spirit. To another, faith, again, by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits, various kinds of tongues, and interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. The Holy Spirit, the one Spirit, this one single Spirit, the same God, the one God, it says it over and over in there. He is the one that wills the gifts, and he's the one that assigns the gifts, and he's the one that hands the grace over to you to say, you can do this. He gives you the ability to, right? So Jesus empowers supernatural ministry because Jesus healed people, because Jesus gave prophetic words, because Jesus did supernatural things. And then the Bible tells us Jesus is the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, He's the firstborn. He is the first one. 
And he who was with no sin, Jesus, God put sin upon him so that the rest of us could inherit his righteousness, so that the rest of us could have his identity, so that the rest of us could have the same identity as a son or a daughter as Jesus did. So now we can move and we can walk the same way Jesus did. We can walk in the same relationship with God because Jesus was God, yes, but he was also an example of a man living in perfect relationship with God. And that's what our goal is. I want to have a relationship with God where I can really hear and say only what he says, and I want to do only what he's telling me to do. That's the goal. I want to live in such a way where I can be so sensitive to the Holy Spirit's draws one way or another, where I can create this community, where I can create the kingdom anywhere I am. I can have the Holy Spirit with me, bringing that grace into other people's lives. Because he is in me and he's upon me for the benefit of others, to bring others into this community. Let's look at Acts and see how they do this. So in Acts 1, we see Jesus risen from the dead. He came back from death. Again, one of my favorite parts of the story where he comes back like that. It's crazy. He comes back from the dead and he says this to his disciples in Acts 1 verse 8. He says, you will receive power. That word there means dunam- is dunamis in the Greek. That's the same word we use for dynamite. It's pretty, pretty good power, po- very powerful power. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. In the next chapter, we see the Holy Spirit fall on the day of Pentecost. Where the disciples receive the Holy Spirit, they begin speaking in tongues and speaking in languages they don't know. It says that there's 14 different languages represented in Jerusalem at that time, and each of them were hearing them in their own language. That's supernatural, wouldn't you say? To the point where they're trying to find any excuse. I, they're probably just drunk, but I don't know. I can't justify it any other way. I don't know what's going on. And Peter stands up and says, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. Give ear to my words, for these people are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. This is saying he's referencing the book of Joel that was written about 850 years ago, saying he said that this would happen, that in the last days it shall be that God declares, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on earth below, down to 21, and it shall come to pass that everyone who comes or calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And Peter finished preaches his message saying, hey, You guys killed Jesus, the Son of God. He came. He is the Savior. He is the Christ. David, I can tell you, he's still in his grave. But Jesus, if you go and look, he's no longer there because he came back to life. And he wants to give you new life. And it says that the people were cut to the heart. And he said, brothers, what should we do? What can we possibly do? Peter tells them, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And it says about 3,000 came to the faith that day through a supernatural occurrence where the Holy Spirit falls, all these languages are now understanding in their own languages. Through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, 3,000 people are added to their number. That's incredible. I want one of those experiences. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> Something crazy happens, and then, oh, there's a crowd. Let me, let me tell them about Jesus. Amen. And thousands of people are saved that day? Come on, that's, that's my goal. I don't know about you guys. Where else do I want to take you guys chapter 5 it says now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles more than more than ever believers were added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women so that they even carried out their sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats that as Peter came by at least his shadow might fall on some of them the people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits and they were all healed there's this misconception that says, hey, this guy has cancer or that woman has cancer because God's punishing them for something or God's trying to teach them a lesson. We don't see that in Jesus. Okay, we don't see that a disease being blessed or sent out to ass- assigned to anyone. We see him heal all the diseases, heal all the afflictions. Andrew 
what did Jesus do when he came in contact with a storm? He calmed them, all of them, right? The hurricane that hit the south side of the United States, that was God's punishment. Jesus never did that. When we say Jesus is perfect theology, you want to study God, you want to know what God's like? Jesus is the perfect study of God. Right? Hebrews tells us that, he is, that God has now spoken to us through his son, Jesus Christ. That's the way that he has put his character on display. Jesus calmed the storms. He never blessed them. There's literally an example where the disciples say to Jesus, who sinned that this man might be ill? Was it his parents or him? And Jesus said, it's neither his parents sin nor his sin, but that God might be glorified, and he heals him. Amen. Right? So this idea that God assigns sicknesses or assigns storms or doles out punishment through those ways, that's not the sign of a good father. That's not, that's not who he is. He heals, and he blesses, and he calms, and he brings peace. That's what, that's what God does. That's who God is. My favorite example today is Philip. Big fan of Philip. I don't know if you guys have read the book of Acts, but if you haven't, take some time to do it. This is literally the days after Jesus left and blessed his people to go out and spread the kingdom. And you see thousands and thousands and thousands of people come to faith in Jesus all over the known world through miraculous signs and partnership with the Holy Spirit. It's incredible. It's where you see that story of Saul, who was a Pharisee, killing Christians. And he was, that was his assignment, to kill Christians. He, he's converted Jesus literally blinds him on the street to Damascus and empowers him and saves him to go and become the guy who wrote most of the rest of the New Testament, who became the, probably the main preacher of the gospel. He went from killing Christians to being the main gospel preacher of the first century church. That's the story that's in Acts. That's one of those stories. It's a miraculous book. In Acts 8, we see Philip. He went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. The crowds, with one accord, paid attention to what was being said by Philip. And when they heard him and saw the signs that he did, for unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. People believed in him when he preached the gospel, and by the signs and wonders and miraculous things he did right alongside them, confirming that Jesus empowers supernatural ministry. This is what comes with it, and joy was in the city. Joy came. It goes on down that he's having this successful ministry throughout the city right here, throughout Samaria. And in that, he's a magician that's healed. And then in the midst of that successful ministry in the city, it says, Now an angel of the Lord appeared to Philip and said, Rise and go to the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. First of all, an angel of the Lord appeared to Philip. That's cool. And then he says to him, I know you're having a ton of success here in the city, healing people, preaching the gospel. I want you to go out to the desert. That's got to be a word from God. That's the only way you're going out to the desert. Because you're having, I'm healing people. People are coming to faith in Jesus. Why would you want me to leave? Go to the desert? No, an angel said to him, and an angel would need to say to him, go to the desert. And he rose and went. Good obedience there. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians who was in charge of all the, her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and, he, and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the Spirit said to Philip, do you guys notice that? The Holy Spirit said to Philip, the Holy Spirit speaks. Okay, this is, this is again, this is supernatural. It's not normal to hear from a spirit. It's not normal to hear speaking from God. This is beyond natural. This is supernatural. And the Spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him, great faithfulness, Philip, and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer, silent. So he opens not his mouth, in his humili humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see, here is water, what prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. 
And they both went down to the water, and Philip and the eunuch, he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, you ready? It's crazy. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. I'd like more explanation on that personally, but that's, that's carried him away. And the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus. And as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Don't try to do this without the Holy Spirit. Okay? You're going to need him. You can see him empowering some crazy ministry here. To lead him to a man, the gospel is not in Ethiopia, but he led him to the one man who has some authority to go and spread the gospel in Ethiopia. Right? And he does. That's crazy. Leads him out of the city into the desert to find this one man, gives him the gospel. Because this man, he doesn't know, he's not a Jew, but he still felt this, I mean, I, I believe in God. I'm going to go to Jerusalem to worship. It's a long trip. Went there to worship. He's reading Isaiah, but doesn't really understand it. Philip is led to him, shares the gospel with him, and he's saved. Amen. Brings the gospel of Jesus into a new country. One final example. I promise it's the last one, probably. Uh huh. We'll go to chapter 11. Because we're, we're emphasizing right now what I've kind of put out there, because people don't really love it, or people might be tempted to ignore it, is the miraculous stuff. The healings, the prophetic words, the Holy Spirit leading you, speaking to you, an angel of the Lord appearing to you, visions and trances. These things are all in the book of Acts, right? This is the supernatural ministry of God. Now, there are gifts of the Spirit that are less miraculous in saying somebody being healed, but they are still effective forms of supernatural ministry that Jesus empowers for us, okay? So, like, if you were listening earlier, I listed off a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge. There's a gift of faith, gifts of healing, gifts of miracles and prophecy. They're distinguishing between spirits, tongues, and interpretation. Also, if you go to Romans 12, you'll hear about the gift of exhortation, which is to mean like to appeal or to urge, to encourage, the gift of exhortation, uh, to persuade, kind of. Um, there's the gift of service. You know servant-hearted people, right? Servant-hearted people. There's the gift of teaching, exhortation again, generosity, of leadership, of mercy, of hospitality, and even of speaking. In First Peter, it talks about that, the ability to speak and teach, preach. These are all gifts of the Spirit that God empowers, that Jesus empowers for the transformation of people's souls into this new identity, into this new kingdom, okay? There's an example here in Acts 11. Now, there are those that were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen. Stephen was killed, and so the, the people in that city scattered away from where they were trying to kill more of them. So after Stephen's death, there was a scattering. And men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, also preaching the Lord Jesus. See, they were preaching the Lord Jesus. That's what they, that's what they specifically say. They were preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord through preaching. The Lord was with their preaching, and that a great many turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came, he saw the grace of God that was upon the people, and he was glad. And he exhorted them. He used his gift of exhortation, of persuasion, of urging, of encouraging. He exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord through his exhortation, through his encouragement, through that gift that he was given. That was the way he advanced the kingdom and grew that church, through the gift of exhortation. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. And for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church, and it says that they taught them, that they used their gift of teaching a great many people. In Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. That's the first place that they were used, the name, where the name Christians was used. It goes on to say, this next part is another gift. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem again to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit. Agabus had a prophetic word. The Holy Spirit led him to deliver this prophetic word that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. A fun little note. Makes me feel like the Bible's so real when it gives those little things. Like just a little extra note to show you that we're in this time period to give you some specific details. 
And so the disciples determined, after this prophetic word, everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. So you see a prophetic word that was brought saying, hey, God has told me there will be a famine in this land. And through that prophetic word, it dictated the mission of the church. Saying that, hey, we received a word from the Lord that before this famine has struck, we can begin planning for it. There's a supernatural ministry there. That's a reason you want prophetic people in your midst. They can dictate a mission. They can say, this is what's coming. This is what people are, God is going to bring. This is what the needs are in our community. This is what's coming our way. And we can make a mission. We can set a plan to go after it. So we, here at Kingdom Life, we absolutely believe in the gifts of the Spirit. Because the Bible says they are real. It says we see in a mirror dimly lit. It says that we see blurred right now, but someday we'll see perfectly face to face. We want to take the words of Jesus that he said to say, hey, for those that believe in me, me and my Father, we will, we will come and make our home with you. We will come to you. I'm not going to leave you as children who are orphaned or who are far off or who are confused, but I'm going to send you another helper, similar to me, an exact imprint of me, the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send you a comforter that in these troubling times that are to come, in these times where I'm telling you to step out in faith, step out in boldness, step into discomfort, I'm sending you a comforter who brings you peace in all circumstances, who brings you joy in the trials, and who will empower you to do ministry the way that I have done ministry, and I tell you the truth, you will do even greater things. We want to take those words, those scriptures, and we want to put them into practice. Because what I see over and over again, you can keep going about when Peter heals Tabitha, or he raises Tabitha from the dead, whole city is converted because of that. He goes to another place and heals this guy who's been paralyzed for eight years, and two different cities Turn to the Lord. Just off one healing. And so for me, what I'm hungry for, the the goal of my life is to see and take advantage of the opportunities that when people are in need of healing, when people are in need of something, to be there and to be the ambassador that Jesus has called me to be, to say, I'm going to step into this within your love, saying, I know you love this person more than I possibly could, and I know, God, your heart is to see everyone healed I know that your heart is to not bless storms and not bless sicknesses, but to heal them and to completely bring them into alignment how you created it and how you meant for it to exist. I'm going to partner with you in that. And I'm not going to allow the discouragement of my experience to say, man, it didn't work one time. It didn't work last time to stop me from doing it. I'm going to continue to persevere and saying, I want to see the supernatural because that's what Jesus told me I could expect. And when I see it happen, and when people get healed, when a prophetic word dictates our mission, we will celebrate it because we know that God is with us, that God has spoken to us, and we can run after it with everything inside of us. And we know other people are going to see that. Nobody gets upset or mad when they get healed. It's a miraculous sign that can gather a crowd and can bring the kingdom into the, into the whole situation. And even if it seems crazy, if it's in here, we want it. Even if it seems impossible, if God says it's a possibility, we're going to go after it. If this makes you uncomfortable in saying, I don't think, I don't think that's what I want to be a part of, that's what we're being a part of. That's what we're going after. I'm, I'm, I'm here to dedicate my whole life in the frustrating times and in the good times, in the times of healing and the times of dryness, to saying, I will not compromise on my theology of what I think this says we're called to do as disciples of Jesus. I'll receive correction. I want to learn more. I want to understand more deeply. I will humbly serve alongside many leaders who will stand. We will stand together on this theology. It's not just me. And we'll move forward learning together and learning together in every relational aspect, hoping to God that he will bless us, show us the grace that the scripture says he shows to people. But we want to be a church community like what we saw in the book of Acts. Where, man, just crazy things are happening through the love and the spirit of God and thousands of people are coming to Jesus. We want to set our sights so high that we can't get there without God. These things are not possible in our own power. 
they're crazy to say in any other context. But I believe in God. I believe he's real. I believe that he's more intimately involved in the details of our lives than we could possibly understand. And I believe he can do anything he wants. And I think he would take advantage of any opportunity he could to show people how much he loves them. Let me pray for us. God, I pray for that, that ability. Just like Paul prayed for the church, that we would have the strength to comprehend all the love, the height and depth and width and breadth of love that you have for us. God, that we would continue to be a church community that speaks love, grace, mercy. Absolutely, we need it. It's the message of Jesus and that we would walk in discipline and obedience and righteousness, saying that my personal life is completely committed to you, God. That we would walk in boldness, God, that you would give us more boldness here to say we want to step out and step into the supernatural. We want to live a life of true partnership with you, God. We want to live a life that's truly empowered by Jesus and empowered by the Holy Spirit. God, we want to consistently emphasize, we want to consistently come back to Jesus Christ, our Savior, our King, the head of our church. We've, we are following you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. For everything that you've done, the ways you've been faithful in years past and the way you will, ways you will continue to be faithful in years to come. Let us set our hearts on the fact, God, that you are good, that you are loving, that you are a father who longs for a relationship with his children. God, give us wisdom. Give us discernment. Father, like it says in 1 Corinthians 14, we will pursue the spiritual gifts. We'll zealously lust after those spiritual gifts. But God, we don't want to lose love. We never, ever, ever want to get away from loving the people we're ministering to. It says without love, we're just noise. God, please continue to expand our hearts, expand our minds to understand your love so that we can love people the same way. And that we can step into their lives in supernatural ways. And that God, your kingdom is advancing. We are here with you. We are confident in you. We trust you. We're so excited to partner with you in this movement. We bless your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Amen.